we are here to talk about the third installment of the Clutch Collector series, which is a re-release of our first album, Transnational Speedway League, remastered vinyl, and I believe it is the first time it's ever been released on vinyl, and here we go. We chose to record at Razor's Edge Studio. Razor's Edge was a studio that the Melvins and Sleep recorded at. We, we liked the way that those records sounded. I think one of the reasons those records sounded the way they did was because of the console that was there. It was a Trident console, and at the time, it seemed like the Starship Enterprise. It was the biggest console we'd ever seen in our lives. That was a big jump in, in recording technology that that we didn't have on previous records. The studio had a proper drum room. Prior to that, we were in, uh, in, a, in a basement with a very low ceiling. Way more microphones than I think we even knew existed. We had been out to the West Coast the summer oh, before right. on our very first U.S. tour. We played Gilman Street Warehouse, and then our return to California would have been our experience at Razor's Edge Studios. The producer on that record was Jonathan Burnside. I seem to remember him very much liking the the quality of your voice and talking about characters, remember that? Like yeah. like a vocal character or something. So he he, he did take a, a lot of time with trying to sort of scope the tones, I think. For some reason I feel like we decided to drive straight to San Francisco without stopping for some reason. That was the original plan. Yep. yep. I don't know why that was a good idea, but... Leave at night in the middle of winter and drive all the way to San Francisco to record. We, we try to make it as difficult as possible. I think we drove 48 hours straight before we... We might have taken a break in Vegas, actually. Yeah. I think we might have stopped yeah. for a few hours in Vegas and then, and then drove through Death Valley. Yeah. <laughs> For fun. At night. At night. Well rested. <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah. one, that's the wrong photo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is a good one. Tim did a lot of the driving back then. The, the band van had shag blue carpet on its interior. It's very sanitary. Thunder Chief. Thunder Chief. And it had two gas tanks. That was a cool thing about it, too. I think in this one, you can see there's a button. On the dashboard, like a little toggle, and you could once one tank ran out, you could get a couple more hundred miles out of it. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, that was great. That was good. That way, we didn't have to stop, and we could just keep peeing in bottles. You guys had bottles. <laughs> yeah. Had shag carpet. <laughs> one anecdote about that record is when we got there, it was uh, the studio was in the Mission District, and I remember like first or second day, there was all these girls hanging out. And I, in my naive mind, was thinking, oh, they're, they're here because they know rock bands are here. And then I found out shortly thereafter that that house was uh, where Anne Rice had written an uh, interview with a vampire on the third floor. So a lot of goth girls would stroll by and look at us in disgust. Just a little anecdote. As far as recording, that, I think that was the first time when we were like in a hotel room like that for weeks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that was that was a that was a new experience being in the mission district left to one's own devices i think it could have gone on much more pear shaped than it did there was also an earthquake there was yes nobody seemed phased by it but us oh yeah i i i immediately stood up and walked to the van i was ready to drive back home yeah well the hallway was crooked <laughs> The, the, I was I was tracking vocals at the time, and they had a microphone and a pop screen, and just I don't know. And the room was built; it's floats, so it's not connected to the house proper. So I didn't feel anything, but the microphone and the pop screen started going like this. And I looked through the control window, and Tim and JP were already up and had both their coats on. <laughs> and I said, "What's?" And I'm on the talk back, and I was like, "Was that an earthquake?" And uh, one of you said, yeah, we're leaving. And I said, <laughs> when are we leaving? And you said, now. <laughs> yeah. The studio also had probably the first Macintosh computer that I'd ever seen. I seem to think that maybe Billy was doing some kind of very primitive editing on that. Do you guys seem to remember that? Yeah. yeah. Kind of. Like, it was like Pro Tools before Pro Tools. It was some... Yeah, and I don't know what... Because it was... It's not the kind of thing that we it was cut to a click, so I don't know exactly what he was doing. Yeah, there was a computer involved at some point. 
for probably not writing an email because that really wasn't a thing yet, huh? Popeyes was a thing. Popeyes was a common theme. Wasn't it directly across the street? I think it might have been. Yeah, right around the corner, maybe. It's very close. There's more stuff here. Let's see what we got. There's a couple photos of Neil with his finger up. That seems to be a common theme. Yeah. Mr. Positivity. I think this was probably taken on our way there. Uh, I realized, like, the day we were leaving, we were going to record a record, and I had to write lyrics. So a lot of the lyrics were written right before we hit the recording button for me to sing on. Um, And I remember a Sony Walkman getting a workout with basement demos of these songs you know rewinding parts over and over and over again chain smoking is that what's on one of these photos in the van it looks like there's a wa- uh, recorder yeah, on the this, dash this thing here yeah what is that is that a recorder I don't know it looks like I'm reading the instructions to whatever it is <laughs> <laughs> something to do <laughs> I can remember us uh, all being in a one-bedroom hotel. This hotel had two double beds and then the um, and then a bathroom. And on more than one occasion, I can remember getting up in the middle of the night to use the bathroom. And <laughs> Neil was in there drinking beers and smoking cigarettes with his with his notepad, writing the lyrics that that were supposed to be sung the next day. Yeah, I think that's what was going on. That's exactly what was going on. Pulling my, and if you if you want to talk about binge and purge, and people always are curious of who or what that's about. The honest answer to that is, I was slated to track the song the next day, and I hadn't written any lyrics, and so I locked myself in that bathroom with like a twelve pack of Mickey's. and a pack of Camel Lights, and then the sun started kind of coming up, and. All those lyrics are sort of uh, me talking to myself in the mirror, losing my mind because I had to go track this song in five hours. The first half would be the kind of solitary confinement. And the second part, the uh, the potty mouth part, that's sort of the, uh, that's the pep rally. So you just go out there and do it, man. Just do it. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, a, that's Binge and Perch. That particular session... In at least lyrically speaking, you know, I was listening to a lot of swans back then, and it was very, very serious matter. And all those lyrics, you know, sort of kind of heavy duty, moody, Catholic dogma rock, I guess. And became apparent pretty quickly, at least for me singing wise, that that wouldn't be a whole lot of fun to do over and over and over again. I'd say that the majority of the record was recorded at Razor's Edge Studio. Once we got home and we listened to what we had made, we realized that we probably should include some faster songs. We were trying to play really slow and sort of uh, doomy. I think that had a lot to, had a lot to do with the other bands that we were listening to at the time. And also, I think we were just being a little bit almost spiteful because it was our major label debut and everybody assumes that a major label debut is supposed to sound a certain way and we did everything we could to make sure that didn't happen <laughs> i think when we went to new york not only the songs were faster but there that batch had a sense of humor that the previous batch didn't shogun named marcus el jefe right. those, are, those are the newest through the new tracks yeah mm-hmm. i think we redid milk of human kindness but did not use didn't it use it yeah, yeah. Wendy Berry, our A and R rep at the time, preferred the version that we did with Jonathan at Razor's Edge. So, oh, really? Yeah. Um, so the the version of Milky Human, Human Kindness that you hear is the original one. The video for Shogun Named Marcus was directed by Dan Winters. Dan also did the photos and the layout for the record as well. So when he approached us to do a video, we were totally into it. And for us, it was really, it was easy. We didn't even perform. I think we just sat in Lazy Boys one afternoon and then went over to uh, a dairy farm that I used to work at when I was a little younger. And that's where you see the combine scene in Shogun Ne Marcus. And then surprisingly, that video got picked up by Beavis and Butthead at the time, which was massive. And we were fans of Beavis and Butthead. That was a, that was a good show. It was the pig balls. Uh, <laughs> so that was good for us. The Beavis and Butthead thing, I think, brought a lot of Clutch fans to the table. We were introduced to Dan, not by accident, but when we, it was time to pick 
photographers or graphic designers of the label had stacks of these folios of different people's works and we didn't like any of it and then we stumbled upon dan we we're like oh this is the dude and we still have a relationship with him now uh, he's, he's a good friend he's done other albums as well he's got a great sense of color to, and there's a lot of symmetry and he's very keen on kind of capturing the details of americana for lack of a better word and we we just gravitated towards it it was just i don't remember what the other folios look like but I think that was exactly it. They, you just didn't remember. Yeah. You, you would look at a photographer's work, and it just it just looked generic. It looked like everything else that you'd seen either in advertisements or in music videos. And so we'd set that one aside and move on to the next one. And as Neil mentioned, there was just stacks of these things. And we didn't know shit about photography, but we knew what we liked. And as soon as Neil came upon... Dan's book. It was it was clear that that's the direction we wanted to go in, and that was great when we met him because he was one of us. Mm -hmm. He had good jokes. He also did self titled Psychic Warfare, Book of Bad Decisions, Elephant Riders. Oh yeah, right? Elephant Riders. Mm -hmm. The video for X Ray Visions. So it's a long working relationship with him. The picture of us around the table and the video was taken in. Uh, the Polka Inn in Essex, Maryland. And we used to do a lot of shows at the Polka Inn with hardcore bands. And it no longer exists. It's a parking lot for a Walmart. Go figure. So it's cool to have that documented both on video and in, in the album. Luckily, Dan kept everything. Everything that we see here is outtakes from the original photo shoot from 1993. The legs are the art director at... East West Atco, Frank Gargiulo. Was he responsible for finding that lamp at like a thrift store nearby? I believe so. Yeah. I think that was sort of the band still, for me, figuring out what the heck was going on because that happened all very, very quickly from recording locally a seven inch of four songs to that with a few things in between. I definitely did not feel like I was ready for prime time just yet, but we got to start somewhere. At the time, it seemed like if you were in a band and you had a seven inch, there was a very good chance that you would get signed. And it was it was that time where I think the labels had a tremendous amount of disposable cash. And so they would just they would sign every band they could. And when they came to sign us, we sort of couldn't believe it. But we said, fuck it, let's give this a shot, see where it takes us. I'm still not sure how we ever got signed to a major label. Much less three separate major label deals. We managed to do that over and over again all through the 90s somehow. <laughs> they didn't learn their lesson, did they? They sure didn't. There was no intention to get on the radio. There was no intention to get on MTV. And I remember ha having meetings with the label or our management at the time and them sort of pitching ideas or, or sort of filling our heads with these ideas that, well, maybe we can, maybe we'll get added to this particular radio station if you do this gig or, so we were not interested in that at all. We didn't want to be on the radio. We assumed that if you were on the radio, it was because you sucked. I think the fact that we were not interested in being on the radio right away <laughs> killed a lot of our enthusiasm at a label. You know, the radio was the easiest way to, or at least at that point, radio was the easiest way to reach a new audience. And we didn't have that going for us because we weren't interested in making those kinds of songs. Well, the, the coolest promotional piece that the label put out was uh, a single with uh, Max from Sepultura playing a Shogun named Marcus with us. That's the most commercial, thing we've, most commercial yeah. thing we've ever done. I was not going to get on the radio, but it was awesome. This is a Gibson Thunderbird piece that I wish I still had. I'd put it on a Craigslist. And sold it like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, before this, I was playing my Fender P bass. I think I can tell what songs were recorded at which studio because in San Francisco I used the Thunderbird and then in New York City I used the P bass. I had that uh, SWR rig. It was like so complicated, I had no idea how to use it, and I ended up melting that thing. Was it called like yeah. Big Ben or something like that, or Goliath? Exactly, yeah. yeah. Melted that, so then I picked up my first Ampeg. Much easier, way less knobs. Yeah, way less knobs, yeah. 
I think I mostly used a JCM 800, JCM 900, I had a Les Paul, and an SG. And also, I was pleasantly surprised when I listened back to the remasters of this with the tuning. Like, it seems like Dan and I were in perfect tune the entire time. It was amazing. Back before auto-tune, we pulled it off. I'm playing an early 70s Slingerland kit. This would be the ones that have a three-ply shell with reinforcement hoops at the top and the bottom of the drums. This was a kit that I found in Austin, Texas the summer before. We were on tour, and we played a venue called the Cavity Club with the American Psycho Band. And we, f- we stayed with a friend of ours, Mike, Mike Flannery, who was in the American Psycho Band. And there was a, a music shop just down the, the way from his house. And so I remember going in there and finding these drums there. I paid $450 for them, and I still have them to this day. They sound great. The bass drum is probably one of my favorite bass drums. That bass drum's been recorded on many other records. One of them would be uh, Robot Hive Exodus. The Jam Room record has this bass drum on it. The snare drum was actually loaned to me by a friend of mine who worked at what was then Venom and Music. My buddy Coleman heard that I was going to go to California and I was going to record a record. And he said, man, you got to take this Roger snare drum with you. You can take it and record with it. And I did. And it was, man, it was a great drum. I did give it back to him. I wish I would have kept it. Hope that's okay, Coleman. And I'm even playing a China cymbal there. Yeah, which was a very short-lived phase. That probably went away after this recording. I did not play any guitar on this record. I didn't really do that until self-titled and that was just a little bit I had an electric guitar and it was like I didn't know that I had quite possibly the worst electric guitar ever made and I kind of gave up on it because I just couldn't play it and then I think it's when I started hanging out with Tim and some other guys that had some really nice guitars like SG's and it I realized that oh it's supposed to it's supposed to feel like this it's not supposed to be painful but no so no gear for me other than a microphone it's an interesting process to go back and listen to something that you played 30 years ago for me some of it seems uh totally familiar very second nature and other stuff that i hear i i have to think about where did those ideas come from and who was i trying to emulate just speaking for myself you know, i was just trying to play like the drummers who were important to me at that time i definitely wasn't trying to create anything new which is pretty much still the same these days starting out in the band i didn't really have a specific vision i was just kind of there for the fun of it and coming from maybe more like the punk rock or hardcore background i thought things like taking vocal lessons was sort of like selling out it's kind of really dumb in hindsight, but it made it kind of more difficult for me to figure out how to sing. And it took me years of just kind of trial and error and throwing stuff over the fence to see where it lands. I know I can sing much better than I did because I have since take vocal lessons. And I think also writing wise, I mean, we were also very young. You, st- you still haven't really figured out a lot. You, you think you have, but you, not speaking for myself, I certainly had a lot to learn. One thing that I, when I do hear those old takes, I'm trying to make my voice sound more gruff than it actually was. Like I said, I was listening to a lot of Swans, a lot of Tom Waits, and you know, I hadn't been on planet Earth long enough to like get that voice. It's listening to these songs is sort of like a diary entry. It's a good snapshot of time, and some of it makes you wince. Uh, some of it, you know. It sounds like a completely different band. I don't know who these guys are. And some of it, like JP said, sounds very familiar because it's still ultimately the same four dudes. I mean, I think if you knew exactly what you're doing, it wouldn't be exciting. The mystery of what's next is sometimes your own ignorance could be a blessing in some ways, I think. Like Neil was saying, taking vocal lessons felt like selling out. I kind of feel like back then putting a song in a pop arrangement was selling out. I mean, that's the way I looked at song arrangements back then. Like, I thought pop arrangements were stupid. You, so, there was, you also were dead set on no solos. Um, you, that was like a point of pride. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was more of, I don't know, kind of noisy, swan slash sonic youthy type Parts. Jesus Lizard was another big yeah, band. As opposed to solo type stuff. At the time, guitar solos were not cool or popular at all. 
nobody wanted to hear heavy metal guitar solos at that time in music. It was sort of like an anti-establishment it, move. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just the fact that there was no internet back then. But basically, we came in at the end, the end of '80s metal. Like we came in at the end of hair metal, and they were looking for something new, like the next Nirvana or whatever. Feedback, noise. Yeah, exactly. People that didn't look like glam rockers. And we, I will say this, like a lot of shows back then, if like co- collectively, if we were in a bad mood, <laughs> we had this kind of passive aggressive attitude. Like we would punish the few people that did show up to the show by playing one riff for 15 minutes over and over again. Maybe we thought we we're going to teach them a lesson. Seems silly in hindsight, but... I think that there was some of that attitude on, you know, recordings where it's like the song also has to be a bit of a, uh, the musical version of crossing your arms <laughs> like that. Um, I think when we opened for Sepultura somewhere in North Carolina, we played like a 20 minute juggernaut and that's all. We taught them a lesson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Never listen to this band again. <laughs> I think there was a show on our first U.S. tour. I feel like it was in Pensacola, Florida. And there was a time, it was mid-set, and you had left the stage. Maybe maybe it was like during a noise break, mm. right? Tim was going... <laughs> and so you went you went to the bathroom, and yeah. then somebody locked you in there. Yeah. And so... Well, I like to lock myself in the back. <laughs> did you make it back on stage? I don't remember. Yeah, I think you did. It was a good 10, 15 <laughs> minutes later. Yeah, you were up there. Tim just blah, 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 the whole time. Sick. I'm, I'm speaking for myself. It really wasn't until self-titled. I think that kind of cemented the musical trajectory that we are more or less on to this day. But, you know, this was a good step. It's kind of like a transition period. You can hear it in like the batch of songs between San Francisco and New York, I think, is step one for Clutch that I think most people are familiar with. I, I like the record. I'm proud of what we did. Um, looking back on it now, it's it is a it's a unique piece of music. It doesn't sound like any of the other bands that were going on at the time, and that just happened by chance. You know, I, speaking for myself, I was just I was playing the kind of drums that I thought were cool, listening to the drummers that I thought were cool, playing along to riffs that I liked. You know, I think maybe that that fuck you attitude back then sort of matured into us just just doing what we want to do only for the sake of enjoying what we do you know the the four of us get together and we make music because because it's the music that we like we're not interested in making music so that we might get on a particular festival or maybe some label will like us or somebody in another band might like us in that way it's it's really like it was 30 years ago we're making music because this is what we want to do and the music that we make is just it's these four individuals coming together and just making ourselves happy. And I say, I sometimes I think about the fuck you attitude can also be manifested itself in having our own record label and showing that, I mean, if, if the four of us can manage to do this, then I don't understand why any, any band would be beholden to the 1993 music school of business. Not in this day and age. You hear the expression that, you know, if you do something that you love, you never will have to work a day in your life. I think that's horseshit. I think if you are lucky enough to do something that you love, you work twice as hard to keep it that way. It's sort of like fuck you, but in a positive context, if that makes any sense. A mature fuck you. Yes, very mature. It was a good record for the tours that we got from that album. The first tour we did was Monster Magnet. Awesome tour. And we were definitely fans of that band. It was Voivod also. That's right. Yep. Sepultura Bad Religion Prong Yeah, Prong was another big influence on this band particularly when we were writing and recording this this album so to do a tour with them was killer We liked Prong a lot They were a metal band Well, first of all they had a groove You know, they were not afraid to play more slowly We liked that part of it They had great riffs and there was a sort of noisy aspect to it that we really liked that we felt like sort of set them apart from the other metal stuff that was going on at the time it had an industrialish kind of uh, influence and that was cool for us we liked that one of the guys was in the swans oh yeah excellent point Ted Parsons 
there was a point we were talking about getting a second guitar player. I offered to put up a little 3 by 5 card on the kiosk at the University of Maryland. And I don't know which one of you wrote it, uh, but I remember it said, you know, local band must, and the requirements is that you had to have your own gear, you were able to do gigs, and that you listened to prong. <laughs> and I think Tim's phone number was at the bottom of it. And That's funny. We got, we got one for a hot second, but he wasn't enough of a fan of prong. I had to go. No. This one looks like it might have been St. St. Stevens. St. Stevens. Downtown, Washington, possibly in the Bell days. Yeah, they probably had a bell up. I, mean, I don't know what then. Yeah, I, I think that's 930 Club. Kind of looks like 930 Club. Uh, looking for the... Looking for the pole? Yeah, I'm looking for the pole. It certainly looks like 930 Club. Or, uh, there's the pole. Pole spotty. <laughs> 930 Club's original location, the stage was a triangle tucked away into the corner of the room, and there was a just a load-bearing pole right kind of in the middle. And there was also one right in the middle of the dance floor as well. They had a crow's nest for a TV camera. I don't know. The, the pole was sort of like a legend in its own right just for being there in the, the most yeah, awkward place. Yeah. You didn't want to get behind the pole because then you couldn't see the band. And then people would, you know, they'd start slam dancing and you might get pushed into the pole or if you might jump off the stage and some kid like might run into the pole. So the pole was was as much a part of the venue as the bands were. Actually, it was kind of the best part, I think. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite. It was on-stage poll and off-stage poll. So that way both band and, and audience could enjoy a poll. Mm-hmm. Enough poll to go around for everybody. <laughs> Ten bands or artists that you that we were thinking of mm-hmm. or listening to back then. And mm-hmm. I'm, I'm thinking of like, you know, not like Black Sabbath or ACDC. I'm thinking about stuff that was like of that era. And we've already mentioned some of those swans. Um, Prong. These are the names that, that I thought of just this morning. Cathedral, Swans, Steel Pole Bathtub, Helmet, Prong, Fugazi, Godflesh, Sleep, No Means No, Sepultura, Internal Void, Jawbox, The Jesus Lizard, Tad, Quicksand. We might have been opening for them here. There. That's quite possible. Mm-hmm. That would explain why there's people at the show. (laughs) I've said swans. That was a big thing. The lyrics, I I love that. And Tom Waits. I was listening to a lot of Godflesh. And, you know, I was listening to a lot of Skinny Puppy. But, you know, your tastes change over the years. Uh, There was a lot of that. And, of course, a lot of the kind of local hardcore that we grew up with. There was a local band named Swizz. And, incidentally, Swizz, and I've said this before, Swizz and Prong, were kind of instrumental in us wanting a name that kind of sounded like that, like this monosyllabic one-word uh, name for a band. And I think Prong and Swizz were, were big influences for, for that. And hip-hop, too. Uh, Public Enemy, that was a big one. Uh, Eric B. and Rakim. Yeah, those, are, those are the ones that come to my mind immediately. Listening to a lot of the Melvins. A lot of, yeah, you know, like New York hardcore bands, Baltimore hardcore bands. Those are the shows that we were playing at the, locally, like when Neil was talking about the Polka Inn. That was with uh, usually Next Step Up. We did a gig there with Life of Agony. Yeah, Life of Agony. Mm-hmm. We did a European tour with Biohazard. That was our first time out of the country. That was even before this record got released. It was it was pretty much right after the recording. I think the only thing I would have to add to JP's list would be early white zombie like for some reason I was really into white zombie back then we made a tape for him and gave it to him that's how much we liked it there was also bands like um, Confessor that's one that we listened to a lot that really we didn't sound anything like them but Confessor I think also was one of those bands who just made music for themselves and and if you guys go back and listen to some Confessor it's unlike anything weirdest band ever and super heavy and sludgy. Yeah, great riffs. Breadwinner, kind of in the same philosophy. You're from what, Richmond? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Big Black would have been another one. The line in uh, a shogun named Marcus, if you thought it was boring in Jordan, that's a direct reference to Big Black's Jordan. Right? So, no kerosene. So, definitely 
enough big block that it actually ended up in the lyrics. We licensed Transnational. There will only be 7,500 copies of this record made. It is a true collector's item. Well, they all are. They're all numbered, signed. This is it. If, if, if you want it, this is the one. It's one and done. Go to clutchmerch.com for details. Yeah, well, 